Um, let's go to the questions. Number one, what is the function of the Norn scene? It was frequently cut in the past. Why is it necessary? I don't need to play in this one. So um, let's, let's hear about that. By the way, you know that the Norn scene was cut very frequently in the past, not just cut, cut in parts. Um, the Norn scene would not be the easiest scene in the ring to cut partially. Can anybody tell me why? There's a good reason. Yeah? Yes, but there, I think there's even within that, there's a very specific reason. Yes? Right. Yeah, it, yeah it, it, it's, you know, it's set up. There's, Wagner likes these um, three part, um, it's, it's, it's organized almost like a musical form in a way. And so, you know, there's Norn 1, Norn 2, Norn 3, interlude, Norn 1, Norn 2, Norn 3, interlude, and then, and then uh, coda, climax. And so it's, um, you, you have to cut one entire section. You couldn't cut part of a section, and you get a very incomplete story. It's, uh, because it's, it's what you said, it's not naturalistically organized. It's not a naturalistic scene. You know, in a naturalistic scene, you can decide to, to cut part of the action as long as it's comprehensible. But it's very difficult in one of these scenes. The same pr uh, problem occurs um, in, um, in another very similar scene in the ring, which is the Von der Mima scene in Act One of Siegfried. That's a scene I think that many stage directors would love to cut. And I'm, I'm sure it, it has been cut. That one you couldn't cut in entirety. But um, I'm sure it's been cut. But it would be very difficult to cut for the same reason because you, you, you really can't be very selective in your cutting. Um, but the Norn scene is cut, for instance, the, the uh, famous um, Norse, Norwegian radio production that was uh, Kristen Flagstad's last appearance with them um, um, didn't have a Norn scene. And of course, it saves you a lot of money, saves you about 20 minutes of time, saves you um, money, you don't have to have the three Norns, um, very long opera. So it's, it's, it's been cut a lot, at least in the old days. So why would this be so bad? It's terrible, but why? Right. Does everybody hear his answer? His answer was that it tells you at the beginning that you're coming to the end of history. In other words, because of the end of the Norn scene, when the rope is broken, it, it uh, and I, I think that is one of the reasons, that it sets up the action of Gunnar Damrung as something which is happening in this post the breaking of the rope uh, world, which I think is, is, is an important function. That was going to say, like, like all the narration scenes, it, first thing, it tells a lot of things, even though it's the ideas we're being told the story that we already know, we're actually being told a great deal of new things. There's all kinds of new information in the Norn scene. Now, some of the new information we will also hear in the Voltrout narrative. One of the excuses was that they said, oh, well, we'll hear about Votan's having had the world heroes pile up the, the world ash tree and make a pyre. We actually don't hear all of that. We hear bits of it in, in the Voltraut narrative. We hear echoes of it, as it were. But um, you, we, we actually learn a lot of new and extremely important information. Indeed, one could say there's a... Um, now, obviously, the Norn scene originally was the beginning of a one of a single opera. And so it had to be packed with all this stuff because it gave the background for the piece. And so the argument usually given in, in, in um, cutting the Norn scene, besides the fact that, as you point out, it's because it's so dark and so sort of um, tenuous, it doesn't have anything to hold on to on purpose, that um, it's a very daring way to begin a five-hour opera. But besides that, you know, they say it's, it's, it's boring, it's unnecessary, it's all of it. It's unnecessary because we don't have to have the story told to us anymore. But the fact is that a great many important things are told. But I also think it's really kind of neat how one part of the history of the world, the part of the rape of the Rheingold, is in the first scene of the prologue of Rheingold. And then another very important sort of mirror part of the rape of, of the world, which is the creation of the spear, even deeper in the past, because clearly Alberich, when he steals the Rheingold, this is in the deep past, but it's in a past far less deep than Wotan's going down, drinking from the wells of wisdom, uh, and, and, and ripping out uh, the, the spear from part of the, uh, the world ash tree, ripping out a branch and making the spear from it. So it's sort of, I like that sort of mirror from the beginning of Rheingold to the beginning of, um, of Gunnar Damrung. Can anybody else, this is a, si a simple question, this, this idea that in Gunnar Damrung, Wagner wants to create kind of a parallel or a mirror of the beginning of Rheingold is not only in, 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 in the Norn scene, that you could look at that in a lot of ways. To look at it as the results of actually Alberich's curse on the ring would be, I think, an unnecessarily 
a mechanistic way of looking at it. Um, um, I think it's more a results of the curse that has been laid on the entire world by the actions of the previous works, that, uh, of, of, of Wotan's bargain with the giants, of uh, Wotan's, um, uh, of everyone's inability to give the ring back to the, the Rhine Maidens, of Alberic stealing the ring from the Rhine Maidens, of, of uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the, the, the actions have, the, have sort of created their own curse. Alberic's curse is, is a uh, powerful symbol and stage device, which by the way, Wagner, and musical device, Wagner uses the curse all the time. The curse becomes, early on in the ring, the curse is sort of a very specific reference to Albrecht's curse on the ring. And we first hear it when Albrecht curses the ring, and then we hear it immediately when, when uh, um, Fafter kills Fasolt, for instance. But as the ring goes on, and especially in Gutterdammerung, we hear it more and more just as, for instance, we hear it when Siegfried, this fantastic passage that, that Simon talked about, Siegfried's arrival at the Gibbetschen Palace, and this big buildup of excitement, starting we sort of hear Siegfried rowing down, rowing up the Rhine, and, um, and um, this big, big excitement, build up, build up, build up, and at the very climax of the building, of the build up, when, when Hagens yells really very powerfully, has to sing out, welcome Siegfried, um, Toya held, I'm um, precious hero. Um, and we hear it with cymbals crashing and three trombones, the curse motive. Now, obviously, I guess you could say, here's Albrecht's curse is going to be working out. But Albrecht himself says that his curse is meaningless on Siegfried because he doesn't know about the ring or doesn't understand its value. But it doesn't really matter at this point. The curse just stands for, the, the, it's become an overall symbol for the baleful condition that the world finds itself in, and, and the consequences of all the things that have happened in the earlier actions. Uh, I just wanted to see if anybody would answer my other question about any place else in Gutterdammerung where we hear a shadow of Rheingold. A very, very obvious and important place, yeah? Right in the opening notes, you have that opening chord, which I, I guess takes place Yeah, that's... <laughs> That's right. Let's, that's absolutely right. I'm gonna, that's one of my questions, so we're going we're gonna, to... But that's absolutely true, though. That's absolutely right. But e even more explicit. That's, but that's very, very good. But Yeah? Yes. The beginning of Act 3 is a total recap. Yeah, it's a recap. You know, how does the ring begin? And we've never heard anything like it before. With those arpeggios, that's even before the nature motive. This is sort of Ur-Musik, you know, sort of... And then we... It's sort of scrunched up a little more, and it's in a different key, but it's it's an, it's clearly a very very explicit um, evoking the very very beginnings before the beginning of the uh, the, the Rhine Maiden scene. Now, one thing it does is it create, forces us to make a parallel between this Rhine Maiden scene and the the, the first Rhine Maiden scene, which is would would be a very interesting topic for a lecture actually. Um, but, but it also forces us to go back to the beginning. The Act 3 of Gutter Dammering is at the, before the very last, this is actually, I think, a, tr uh, a terrific theatrical, as much as musical, uh, um, uh, feat of Wagner's. Before the very end of a 15-hour work, he forces us to remember the very beginning. The beginning. I mean, that's... Uh... Okay, but let's, let's go back now to the, to the book. Um, so it's, we've, we've agreed. It's necessary um, as... Um, as, 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 because of the information it gives us. It gives us a lot of information about the, the, the roots. So the, if I understand anything about the Norn's rope, the symbol, symbolism would be that since the, Nor, the Norn's rope breaks, I don't know if um, um, Norse mythology is based really on a concept of um, inexorable fate. I mean, even in, even, I think that they have this feeling that there is fate, but there is also some leeway within fate. But, but in any event, even if the Norns are the symbols of fate and their rope is the, is the, the vehicle upon which the, the fate of the world is, is imprinted, um, my understanding would be clearly that once the, the rope breaks, sort of you know, all bets are off. We don't know what's going to happen. And you're absolutely right. There are two, that's a very good point though, that there are at least two moments in Gutterdammerung where the action clearly could have gone in different directions and would have certainly had major ramifications. Um, whether or not, if Siegfried had decided to give the ring back to the Rhine Maidens, he would not have been murdered or he would have salvaged his relationship with Brunhilde, I don't know. But certainly, if Brunhilde had given the ring back um, uh, at the time when, when, when Valtraut says, it probably would have had ramifications. The, the Rhine Maidens make a very bad tactical mistake. The Rhine Maidens 
But first, try to tease the ring out of him. Say, gosh, you're so good looking, but you're so stingy. You know, does your wife beat you? You know, are you in a bad mood because your wife beat you? In other words, they try to shame them teasingly into giving up the ring. Yeah, and then they run, they run off. And of course, the result, and then Sigrid would say, you know, I hate to be teased by these women. They can have my ring. And then they come back, but now they start to warn him. The very first thing out of their mouth is, we warn you, Siegfried. And, and, and once they start to warn him, then the, any chances of him giving them the ring, of his giving them the ring, is gone. Because he won't be scared into giving it. He might give, and he even says that, he says, you know, as, as for, sort of as a love token, or as for sort of as a, you know, a flippant act of generosity, I might give you this ring but not if you warn me from it. So, yeah, I'm not afraid, right. Although whether or not Siegfried is completely without fear anymore, we talked a lot about the nature of what this, the fearless hero means. Um, but in any case, Siegfried clearly is not going to give it up for, for of course, I mean, obviously there are, <laughs> in a way this is all completely useless, except in so far as it helps us understand the characters better because, um, and maybe the ramifications of their actions better. Because of course the, the um, um, the story is, 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 is Wagner's. And so, you know, he, he's gonna, the people are going to do what they're going to do in terms of what he needs to have them do. Um, the, I, I just, this is not one of the... Do I have a question about the Valtraut scene? Yes. yes, I do. I want to go into the Valtraut scene later because I have a rather different take on the Valtraut scene than I think um, um, most people do. The implication seems to be that Siegfried, as the, as the free hero, um, will ha has broken through, and he sort of says the same thing in the Norn scene, break, broken through the inevitability of their fate, which, and it is no longer valid because of Siegfried. Um, I don't know this, and this is, just, this is an answer given just as one, you know, as, as my, my, my answer is no more valid than any of yours in this particular category. But if someone were to make me a list of the things that are in the ring that date from Wagner's earliest conception of the ring, and that Wagner didn't change, um, um, because he changed very little of the text, but which s don't fit very comfortably on the ring as we have it. And there's a long list that many people make. Uh, Ernest, Ernest Newman makes a long list, and almost all of them, I think, are wrong. I think he's not right. But this is one that I think he is. Um, another one where he does mention, he doesn't mention this one, but one that he does mention that I think he's probably right. You know that when, um, in the first scene of the Gibbetschen, Business, act one, actually scene one, not the prologue of Gunther Demmerung. Um, Hagen is telling Gunther about uh, the, the Nibelung horde, that Siegfried is, is, is kill the dragon and won the horde, and that the horde contains this ring that, you know, has the, the, the might of the world. And, and, and Gunther says, and he's won it? I mean, obviously he's trying to get Gunther interested in Siegfried. He's, he's putting out the bait. And, 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 and Hagen's answer is, the Nibelungs are slaves to him. And the implication of this is that because Siegfried has the ring, the Nibelungs are automatically his slave. Now, there's nothing in the ring that we have, the ring, by the ring I mean the Sling, the Nibelung and the cycle, that we have today that implies that because Siegfried has the ring, the Nibelungans are automatically his slaves. On the contrary, everything that we have um, in the, the ring cycle today would seem to indicate that the only person who has real power to use the ring to enslave the, the Nibelungans, for instance, is Alberich. Um, but uh, uh, Wagner probably had a different concept. So that would strike me as a line of text which is not terribly consistent. Um, but the, your question about the Norn scene is a much more troubling one because it's one thing to have a line of text which um, seems problematic uh, um, with the current ring as we have it. It's another thing to have music because the music, of course, is all, is, 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 cannot be anachronistic. But there are, some, it would be impossible to say that there are no places in the ring where motives prominently occur that um, uh, cannot be explained clearly. Um, because I will say one thing too, I'm the first to say in Gunnar Dammerung, motives are used very sim metaphorically, symbolically, and that it's impossible to look for one-to-one -one correspondences. The, the Tarnhelm is a perfect example. The Tarnhelm is used all over Act I and a little bit Act II of Gunnar Dammerung in places where it makes no sense as any kind of direct relation to the Tarnhelm, but it makes every bit of sense if you take the Tarnhelm as this overall metaphor for trickery uh, and, and illusion. Why is the Norn scene important musically? The main purpose, from a musician's standpoint, of the narration scenes, and the Norn scene is a narration scene, by narration scenes, I mean scenes where we're basically being told in one way or another things that have already happened. 
you know, like the Mima Albrecht scene is largely, um, the Mima, not Mima Albrecht, the Mima Vondera scene is largely a narration scene. Votan's narrative. Uh, uh, I, and I think you were here last year, weren't you, or were you? Yeah, I mean, I have the whole list of all the things that are, there are a lot of narration scenes in the ring. And, and, and um, um, this is one of the big ones. And, but one of the, and they do function to tell uh, old, you know, to, 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 and to give new information or new outlooks or new points of view. But from a musical standpoint, yes, they bring up the old, I'll be, just to say, I haven't forgotten you. I, let me just talk. Um, they give us the chance to hear old music in new contexts. And that's, that is, that is the, the primary function, because the old music in new context does a lot of things. First thing, it redefines old music in, in, in ways. We will not listen, we will not hear it again in the same way. Um, much, much of the material in the ring passes through the Norn scene, for instance. Even more of it passes through the, the Vonder Mima scene, actually, in Act One of Siegfried. Um, but all of it is changed by, it's all con contaminated in some way by the circumstance. Um, a lot of the music that we hear, for instance, in this scene, is music that we haven't heard in a long time. And it comes in the context of, of a new harmonic language and, and company with new motives. You know, one of the ways in which the ring is different from um, traditional music, musical forms. In traditional musical forms, composers develop their material by literally developing their material. In other words, you have Beethoven has... And then, at the, some later point in the movement, it becomes... And then finally in the coda, it becomes... And just baldly put here, it, it's kind of a meaningless, it doesn't it sound very exciting. But actually, his doing that, and the way he creates this incredibly long narrative line, is probably may be the single greatest triumph in the history of classical music. The real justification of class, what classical music uh, is all about, uh, which is telling a story in, in, in music. But, but Beethoven's means are much more limited than Wagner's. He can turn around the, the musical material, and he can metamorphize it in little ways, and he can change its accompanying world. But Wagner also has the whole world of dramatic association to deal with. So for instance, if, if just the very fact that we hear a motive attached to another motive, changes the way we appreciate this motive. Just, just the very conjecture. They don't have to have anything to do with each other. But if we hear them together uh, uh, several times prominently, we should not hear the, the, the either of those two in the same way as we heard before. Let me give you a very, very concrete example. Um, or just, um, or uh, Rheingold, Rheingold. We've, we should, all of us, see, hear, think of the, the, the joy of the Rhine maidens uh, in their sort of triumphant calling over the, over the Rhine gold. Okay, if I hear, you know, you hear the forest birds, one of the forest birds. But starting in, well, a little bit in, in, at the very end of Act Two of Siegfried, but certainly as Siegfried's uh, getting ready to go through the fire and in the scene going through the fire, we start hearing, um, uh, that's a good place to start. <laughs> Um, we start hearing them put together. We have T, and they become almost interchangeably together. As a matter of fact, in Gunnar Dämmerung, we hear them together all the time. So all of a sudden, the forest bird has somehow become attached to uh, this, this Rhine Maiden's Call of Joy in something that we associate with Siegfried's going through the fire. And the, Siegfried's greatest moment, or one of Siegfried's greatest moments, is sort of heroic uh, uh, freedom. He's just broken the spear and He's heading up the mountain. He's going to find a great new adventure and a woman to boot. Um, so so the, the association has changed. And this changed really in a way for both of them. They no longer mean exactly what they meant before. And this, this happens in the ring hundreds of thousands of times. Because, I mean, it happens more times than anyone could ever count, really. Because it's constantly happening. I mean, the, the very nature of the ring is, is that it's so labyrinthine. There's so much material. And the material is put together so much. Obviously, the, the, the really important number of times is, is much, much smaller. There's just, there's just maybe a few dozen. But, um, um, and this happens a lot, and especially 
in these narration scenes, and in the Norn scene in a very special way. So I think one of the functions of the Norn scene, as in all the narration scenes, is to bring old material back, put them in new context, and give them new meaning, and indeed, new sounds. They, 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 they sound different. For instance, in the Norn scene, we hear this as in part of the refrain. Well, what do you, what do you hear when you hear? It sounds to me like, if I played, but it's, it's minor, and it's sort of taken all those big chords out. But there's, it definitely reminds us of it. And so that's, this, it, it gives us a way to sort of um, uh, enlarge and, and increase the range of association of, of, of motifs. And that's certainly uh, very, very true of the Norn scene, um, but also very true of all the other narrative scenes in the ring. But there's, so there's still something else very important about the Norn scene musically, specifically the Norn scene. I think that one of the primary functions of the Norn scene is as a counterpart to the last scene of Siegfried. The last scene of Siegfried, to my ears, the very last scene of Siegfried, in other words, after Brunhilde has been won over. Uh, so the very last part of Siegfried um, is, is almost maniacally uh, up. It's, it, they're just incredibly up. And the music is in this, in this almost, almost hysterical, uh, um, you know, up. Uh, the, the Übermut. Uh, 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 it's very, very... Uh, uh, and and, and uh, it's always actually... I find it... Just, the end of Siegfried never leaves... I adore Siegfried. Siegfried is the, is the part of the ring that gives me the greatest pleasure, all things considered. But the end of Siegfried is almost so up that it's, it seems it can't be true. And the Norn scene, which starts with some of the very same material, um, is very much a counterpart. And, and, it's, and it also changes, I think, very much the way that we hear in the next up scene, which, of course, is, is the duet between um, Siegfried and, 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 and Brunhilde, the, the part two of the prologue. The prologue has a very dark part and a very bright part. And, and well, it actually has, I'm answering my own questions too much here, it has a very dark part and two very bright parts, different bright parts. Um, the, bright, the two bright parts being the duet and the journey to the Rhine, which is also very bright, very up, right? And almost festive. Uh, um, so I think it's a very necessary, it's, it's an introduction to, to uh, the world of Gutter Demerung. It brings in a lot of, of old material. It, it makes us hear it in a new way. It introduces also a, a whole harmonic world of Gutter Demerung, uh, which would take us too far field right now, but I think also it's just this very necessary balance of light and dark, and a very necessary contrast to the end of Siegfried. I really hear it very much as a contrast to the end of Siegfried, too. Um, should we go on to the next question? Okay. Okay, this, and this is, uh, these, these first five questions are all interrelated. Um, what is the function of Siegfried's journey to the Rhine? Which, as far as I know, has never been cut. I, I doubt in any ring anywhere they ever cut the Rhine journey. So, but, but, but why does Wagner have such a long orchestral interlude here? It's one of the longest... What? Change the scenery. That's right. The only reason he had it was to change the scenery. If we could have had a more modern-day version where they had c computers doing it, Wagner would have never written this scene. That's, of course, the answer. Let's go on to number three. <laughs> does anybody believe that, by the way? What is the need for the, the, the Rhine journey? Maybe the need for... I'll tell you a much more likely answer, one I don't believe either, is that Wagner was looking for a way to make money. And he knew this would be a nice, uh, excisable passage that orchestras could play, to, uh, to, and he could make money. That would be a far better reason, and far more in line with Wagner's character, than that he put it in because he needed time to change the scene. Especially, that's a long time. The Rhine journey lasts about seven or eight minutes. So, it's a, What do we get out of the Rhine journey? First thing, you know, th this farewell could have been kind of sad, right? I mean, they're saying goodbye, and yet it ends in this very high up, exalted, joyous thing, and it remains that way. It definitely remains that way. You know, and the atmosphere is certainly sustained of joyous, free, uh, exciting, you know, exuberant, and it goes on for a while. And then it um, gets to the Rhine. We're having a great time listening, big, big exhortation of the arrival of the Rhine in A major, which is very interesting from a musical standpoint. A major is the furthest distant key possible from E flat major, which is the key that we have a deep association with the Rhine with, since the, 
We have 135 measures of it without modulation at the beginning of Rheingold. That's about as strong a foundation as you could get. Um, anyway, so this, this, but there's, you could make something of that too, actually. But then what happens? What happens, what happens at the end of the Rhine journey? Not just the last measures, but the last, what happens to the music? What, what, what happens in the Rhine journey? What happens to the music? Well, it, it ends up with the plotting music of the Gibbertrons. What happens in between? What, 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 what sort of takes over? We start, hearing all the, we start hearing all the music associated with the ring. In the middle of all this joyous stuff, at first it comes in really happy. It comes in, you know, uh, oh. Um, um. And all of a sudden, the music is colored by the horns. With they're, they're, they're stopped up, and the, the English horn. There's an extreme darkening of the music without any allusion to the Gibbetsons yet. As a matter of fact, I find it always physically painful to listen to the Rhine Journey because at about three quarters of the way through, it gets so dark. It goes from being so bright to so dark, and so it does prepare us for the for the Gibbetsons enormously well. But it prepares us. It sort of reminds us. <laughs> that uh, in spite of all this stuff, there's all this sort of unresolved business in the ring. That the, the it, it kind of makes the love duet and its joy, it prolongs it, but it kind of makes it um, um, seem more illusory. It makes the, the, it certainly does this. It makes the sense of the um, distance, not in time, but sort of in, I don't know, in, 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 in mood or in, in sort of spiritual significance or otherwise, between this, this exalted free world um, of, Sieg, of, of Siegfried and Brunhilde on top of the mountain to this uh, corrupt political world of, of the Gibbetsund Palace, it, it, makes us, it makes it very, um, a very vivid passage from it. One, I think, which is much more vivid and emotionally uh, um, potent than it would be by just having a quick you know, end, of the Gibbet, uh, end of the love duet scene and then a, 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 a quick um, transition to the, to the Gibbetsunds. It only prepares the Gibbetsund scene itself in the very last line, which gets very dark indeed. It goes it, it, with extraordinarily quickness, I must say, from some of the brightest, most sort of bright, I mean luminous music in the ring to some of the darkest, very, very quick. Um, but I think it's necessary as this passage. Also, talking about mirrors, as just as the Norn goes from dark to the bright of the, of the love scene, then we have the return to dark. Although the darkness of the Norn scene and the darkness of the Gibbetschuk scene have very little in common. They're very different kinds of darkness. Very different kind of darkness even just in orchestral colors. The Norn scene is played with muted strings and these very suffused co chords. Norn scene is one of the, one of the scenes, not, not too many of them in it, I think, actually, that really sound great at Bayreuth. I'm not a huge fan of, of the way orchestra sound at Bayreuth either. Simon and I agree on that. Um, I, I like, I like, the orchestra's never loud enough to me in Bayreuth, never. But it sounds great in the Norn scene because it's, it's not loud anyway. And it's so colored, such colored sound, such mixed, such uh, mixed, dark, mysterious. By mixed, I mean you can't tell who's playing. There's the little, little, or little voices come out and then disappear. You know, or already like, just for the very beginning of it, you know. That sort of just kind of floats up through everything. There's that. This very long line played by the bass trumpet, sort of floating down through all this very complicated mixed uh, uh, um, muted strings. Whereas the, 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 the sound of the, of the Gibbetschuk scene is very solid and rough with lots of brass, lots of chords, lots of heaviness. So they're utterly different in their darkness. But they're both dark, certainly. Okay, let's go to number three. What is the function of that long orchestral interlude between the Gibbetschung scene and the Waltraut scene? This was very often cut. Indeed, it is, it is cut, it is so, on the old Decca LP with Flagstad. And why is it so horrible to cut this scene? You know, there's been this sort of very excited exit of Siegfried and um, uh, um, Gunther to go up to Brunhilde's rock and, and get them. And then Gunther sits by him, and then Hagen is left by himself and gives his famous watch. And then after his watch is over, um, there is a whole lot of music very similar to the music we heard in Hagen's watch. Um, not quite the same because um, a new element is added. Let me just play a little bit. Of, I played a little bit of the other day, but just a little bit. If, the, if this is going, I'm, I'm going to have to have help. But if, if the uh, AC is off for a while, I think I'm all right. Thank you. 
that's of course the most mournful thing in the whole ring, that version of that motive. Just to refresh her, I'm going to be very didactic here. Fresh your imaginations. This was originally and then became and now in this good of form it's but he's here he's really spread it out and then we have finally now that's just exactly like Hagen's watch right Hagen's watch starts with with that Hagen gesture plus the 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 tarnum. Um, here it starts mm. Actually, that's an interesting motive I was just playing. It only occurs three times, but it's very interesting. Um, uh, uh, Michael Tanner has a great name for it, which is the, 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 the nobility of evil. <laughs> a very Michael Tanner-ish kind of name. Um, so th there's new elements that he's added to the material from the Hagen's Watch, which in a way sort of also clarify certain things. I mean, the fact that we've heard it, it with a ring attached. But I think that what I find really very powerful is having, it's not just the... This distortion of Siegfried's horn call that we've had before, which is already pretty horrible to, to hear, but this 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 Siegfried sort of heroic motive now attached to very loud, heavy, dark, low uh, a spear motive. Um, um, of course, the spear being used. Well, that's another question. We've already talked about it, but anyway, it it this is um, it's. What I think it does, just in two words, is it takes the, the sort of local, dark, evil quality of Hagen's watch and makes it cosmic. These are these very cosmic motives, the ring, Siegfried, the, Siegfried's heroism, the spear, and sort of, you know, it's this, this very sort of cosmic moment in the ring. Um, this is probably the darkest moment in the entire ring. Um, not darkest in terms of our, obviously the darkest moment in the ring for us is the story is probably the death of Siegfried or the death of Siegmund or something. But I'm talking about just in terms of the music, this, this interlude. So then what finally happens in this interlude? Um, um, because that's relatively, that's less than half of the length of the interlude. Because then there's a sort of very uh, sustained part. And then we have a part starting...
The curtain rises here. What's that? This it's the magic potion. I always think that this is maybe the moment when Siegfried is actually far, far away um, um, take, drinking the magic potion. But anyway, that's just a little fantasy on my part, but it's very interesting. Um, I played a lot. Um, so what, what, what's happening in all this music? Very, very beautiful music. Well, first thing, it's dominated by this new mode of, of, of Brunhilde's. And it's being mixed with a lot of other material. It's being mixed with, which is one of the most unambiguous um, motifs in the ring. It's just the curse. This, this one never has anything other than the most baleful associations. It's not good to hear Brunhilde's motive mixed with the curse motive. This is a very bad thing. And, and uh, uh, we have a sense that she's, she's, getting in, she's getting mixed up in the whole business. But even more interesting to me is what happens in this later part with the ring motive. This, where the ring motive, is, which is usually so, so dark and kind of slimy, spooky, almost becomes a very tender and, 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 in other words, actually, I think he's portraying very, this is a terrific bit of a little musical portrayal of what's happened that uh, um, Brunhilde has fallen in love with the ring. The ring has become a love token to her. I mean, she has. The ring has become the token of her love to Siegfried. And we hear the, the curse underneath, which I guess shows some, I'm, I'm not going to get into the mechanical, mecha mechanistic aspects of Albrecht's curse, which don't interest me, which I really don't really believe in. But um, I th um, nevertheless, it, Brunhilde is, 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 in spite of our having seen her as this free, and, and heroic figure is being be, becoming enmeshed in the problem, which, which of course she will be. She will be in the very next scene, as a matter of fact. Um, so I think that this scene is not only um, again a, tr a, a, a transition, you could say, from uh, dark to light. But the Valtrot scene is not very light, so it's kind of a, a transition from dark to another kind of dark. But I think it's more about imparting a whole lot of information and about enlarging and increasing and changing our understanding of Brunhilde. Also, um, it starts out as sort of just an extension of what we'd heard before with Siegfried, but it, it then develops into this whole latter part of the, of the, um, the uh, interlude as, as being, I think, about Brunhilde. And it certainly makes me feel differently and very troubled about Brunhilde. Um, it's not, it shouldn't be easy or pleasant or um, comfortable listening, even though it's so beautiful. Um, okay, so here's number four. What is the function of the, the Alberich Hagen scene in Act Two? It was often cut too. That one was cut a lot. Uh, as a matter of fact, someone told me, um, who's a historian, that um, except in Bayreuth and when the Met did uh, their festival performances, it was essentially always cut. Uh, there was you, um, all, you essentially never heard the scene. That there were, they would play the prelude and go straight into the um, the, the dawn. Business, you know, the very easy to do, actually. This is a, kind of a nice, easy musical. Um, uh, and this scene was seen, um, as a matter of fact, one explanation I have read of why this scene was written was as um, just as a means to, to give the, the Albert, the, the Alberich was uh, someone that Wagner wanted to make sure made a little more money and would give him a chance to get paid for another opera. So that's a, that doesn't stri strike me as a very valid reason. Hagen's relationship to his father actually is a little mysterious, isn't it? Um, and Albrecht's relationship to, 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 to Hagen is, is kind of complex, too, because um, what do we know for sure about Albrecht, or at least what he says, what he's done, is he's, he's cursed love. He's not supposed to love anything or anybody. And yet he does seem to sort of love, in a kind of pathetic way, Hagen. It, it changes my feelings about Hagen, this scene, but it even more changes my feelings about Albrecht. I think that uh, this scene is necessary for any number of reasons. It's very important to have Alberich come back on the scene. It's important to see Hagen's relationship to Alberich as kind of a, a, a parallel. I was thinking not just between um, Wotan and Brunhilde, but between Wotan and Siegfried. I mean, it's not his son, it's his grandson, but still. But I think also it changes the way I feel about Alberich, especially. Uh, Alberich comes out of the scene. Um, Alberich, is, is, Alberich, first thing, I am one of the ones who, who uh, battle rather vehemently against the tendency in, in many productions of The Ring today to emphasize sort of Albrecht as being kind of a good guy, sort of a pathetic, poor little fellow, and the Wotan is the really bad guy. 
And that's sort of like saying that Churchill, who was certainly corrupted, was the bad guy and Hitler was just the furry little fellow. Because Albrecht is very good. A, a, a great deal about Albrecht would be a very good portrayal of, of, of a potential um, Adolf Hitler in the making. I mean, Albrecht, everything that Albrecht says in, 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 in Rheingold, I mean, in the scene three of Rheingold, is just as loathsome as possible. And we, we feel sorry for him because he loses, maybe. But Albrecht is a terribly frightening and awful person. Um, and doesn't even have the wonderful humor that Hagen does. Um, but, although there could be some humor, I suppose, in Albrecht, but, but there's something almost pathetic. And, and, and it's, it's a fantastic portrayal of how two people whose lives are dedicated to, to hate, um, um, there's a kind of pathetic, they may be allied in a way, and there's bonds, bonds between them, but it's, 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 it's very, and it, I think it shows Wagner's extraordinarily broad um, vision. And, and how far Wagner is away from the sort of cookie-cutter villain, cookie-cutter hero um, that we usually associate with opera. Um, so to me, the scene is, 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 besides which is incredibly musically, it, it's the scene which has probably um, some, of the, some of the most advanced harmonic language in the ring. And just, just going back, just one little thing from this scene, going, which almost you almost never hear because it's, it's very... Um, uh, darkly colored, and it was certainly uh, not, um, you could not hear it in, in, in uh, yesterday's because at Bayreuth you just don't hear the orchestra well enough. Um, you know, I was talking about how this becomes this becomes. Well, in this scene, he goes one step further. Um, um, it's understandable that there's a lot of that in this scene, but I'd like to play just one little passage from this. It's one of my harmonically favorite places. First thing, this cadence. Everybody know what a cadence is? Literally means closing, I suppose, from cadere in Italian. And it's just, yeah, cadence would be... That's a cadence, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, it's like a, it's a full stop, it's a period, it's, a, it's the end of something. It's, it closes, it's a closing. And one of the big characteristics in, in, in Wagner's style, especially in Tristan, is the delaying or disguising of cadences. Well, it gives Tristan this sense of constantly being pressed forward as if the cadences are... That's not necessarily a characteristic of the ring. But, so this particular cadence, I mean, what it is, is just a, a cadence into, into E-flat minor, which is a very dark key. It's hard because of the, the wind blowing on it. So but this, this one is great. First thing, also the material, but... I could play that all day. That is just amazing. Um, um, it's it, it just, if you do it that way, but this, it's the, the voice leading. What's voice leading? I'm using too many words here. Voice leading is, you know, if, if you look at chords moving, and don't look at them as chords, but as if like people were singing, the voice leading is how each of the individual lines would go. You know, if you looked at it that way, and that's the, the way we hear music is enormously affected by that. I mean, just enormously. Whether or not you know anything about it, it's affected by it. And what this, this one, he goes, but the way he does it is by having the prominent voice go. So it's. I know, I'm still on this page. It's great. Thank you very much, Guillaume. I think it's pretty good to have a society where the, one of the members of the board holds the pages open for me. 
Thank you. No, because I'm done. Um, so I was just, this amazing, this. And then even more amazing. If I just isolate, those are pretty, those are pretty weird sounding chords, aren't they? But it's actually just turned around. It's, that chord is the same as, um, so I really, he's just really altered one note. He's turned the, the he's, he's done, he's become, but he's changed the order. So they, they go, this is the most advanced harm. This is, this sounds like something written in the middle of the 20th century. I mean, this is the most advanced harmonic language in the ring and this scene. So this is, this is an amazing scene from that standpoint too, that maybe almost uh, metaphorically, this, this portrayal of the darkest evil, as it were, inspires in Wagner this, this ex exploration of this extremely dark harmony. Okay, moving, moving onward. What is the function of Siegfried's narration in Act Three, Never Cut? We've already talked a lot about this, so I'm gonna go very fast. Um, one, of the ex one of the functions of it is, by the way, it has less than any of the other narrations in the, in the ring, the function of combining motives with, uh, we're too, it's too late in the ring to do that very much. In other words, to give new meaning to motives by bringing them back in new context. Um, it does have that a little bit, but I think its main, uh, part of its function is, is, as Simon has pointed out, it makes Siegfried by uh, his also becoming a, a character uh, talking about his past, it sort of makes him more, more tragic, but also makes him perhaps more fallible, more caught in the webs of the past. Indeed, he does so just before he dies. But to me, the most important function of it, dramatically, is, is that Siegfried um, um, starts finding himself. And that the Siegfried that dies is, is once again a Siegfried about whom we have very positive feelings. Whereas the Siegfried, who, before he begins this tale, is one about whom our feelings have become much, much more compromised. Uh, perhaps not as, I think they should not be quite as compromised as they're usually portrayed as being. Nevertheless, they've definitely been compromised. Um, um, I think it's very important for Wagner that we, um, in spite of his flaws and things, that we be very shocked, hurt, moved, and saddened by Siegfried's death. And that um, um, I, th I think that this, this, the, the, the Siegfried's tale is the, the way that we sort of, Siegfried refines himself and we refine the old Siegfried by hearing Siegfried in this magical new way. There's a whole lot of material. This, would, this scene would be a great one to, to look at. This is, um, there's no better music in the ring than the music of, of Siegfried's narration and, and no better example of little subtle difference. Just to give you one example, very, very quickly. Um, you know, the, the force murmurs are usually, or, This very sort of shimmery, smooth sort of sound. That's because it creates a sort of sense of a, of, a, of a background. You're in the forest, you have this kind of constant background sound. Very wonderful tone painting, which is just, by the way, the same music that we heard of. Because it's, it, that's just, it's, it's in other words, it's sort of the voice of nature. That was the voice of nature as water. This is the voice of nature as the forest. But when it comes back in Siegfried's tale, when he starts remembering after this incredible episode, back staccato instead of being I can't do the difference on a bad piano very well but instead of this being smooth it's now it's, 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 it because it feels like it's magical it has this almost sense of a complete rapt uh, ecstatic we've heard it once before in the ring uh, staccato and that's the very moment when Siegfried tastes the dragon's blood only then then and only then is a staccato all the other times it's, it's, it's smooth, but there it's staccato because th at that moment the, 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 the forest becomes magical to Siegfried. Of course, he can understand the birds. And, and by the way, this phrase before, this, 
this to me is the most nostalgic music in the ring. No music in the ring, nothing in the ring, to me conjures up this feeling of this sense of this bittersweet remembering of the past. I, I, I think this is overwhelmingly the most nostalgic woman in the ring, uh, this, this place in Siegfried's Tale. Siegfried's Tale, like all the, 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 um, almost all the narrations, is divided into groups of these three, that has this three-part form. Um, like the Norn scene was a double three-part form, and uh, the, uh, the, the um, Votan Mima, the Vandera Mima scene is a double three-part form. This is a single three-part form uh, 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 with an introduction and a, and a coda. Everybody know what a coda means in music? Okay. Uh, so, it means tail, actually, literally in Italian. Um, in the third part, of course, it's a little different from the first two because he's drunk this other potion to make him remember women again. Don't forget, Siegfried has not suffered from amnesia. He's forgotten one thing by the potion. He's forgotten any woman he ever knew before. So if we're going to go into the, mechanis me the, 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 the mechanisms of the potion, he's forgotten women. He's forgotten that he, was, had a, he ever had fallen in love with a woman before. And that's what he remembers. And so in this third part, he remembers going through the fire, and the fire, as I showed you the day before yesterday, becomes more and more ecstatic. It completely changes its character. It never had this sort of erotic character before. And, he, and the very last thing he says is, and then I, I, threw my, I was, found myself in Brunhilde's arms. He's never used the word Brunhilde until the very end. This is the first place where he, he specifically says that Brunhilde is in his arms. Just a second. Uh, just let me just finish, and then I'll ask you. Um, the Brunhilde is in his arms. And of course, once, once uh, um, Gunther hears this, any illusion, I mean, I think it's all very clear what, what uh, Hagen has pulled on him. And he jumps up, and uh, Hagen immediately says, and Wotan's ravens, I guess, are around, because they're always around. For, for, and he says, that you, you hear those ravens? And, and Siegfried, who's probably kind of dazed at this point anyway, stands up and he stabs him in the back. So, I mean, the, the sequence is fairly clear. Why does Hagen give him that potion? Why doesn't Hagen just stab him in the back? Why, why, why does Hagen need him? Why does Hagen have him tell this? Why doesn't, why doesn't he just say, hey, Siegfried, what's that behind you? And they go, bam. Why doesn't he do that? But why does he need to confess? It's all for the vassal's sake. The vassals are there. They're hearing this story. So he's going to say, hey, you know, your lord has no right over Brunhilde. He has no right over anything. And therefore, he has no right over the ring. Therefore, the ring is mine. That's, that's, th th that's the reason. He want, he's doing it for the vassal's sake. Otherwise, there's no reason to do it. I mean, you know, it's great for us that he does, because we have all this wonderful music, and, and, and it, and it re rehabilitates Siegfried to us. Number six, how do we hear immediately in Gunther Demmering that light motives will be used in a new and different way? Remember, I talked about the first night that in, in, in Gunther Demmering, light motives are used much more metaphorically, much more symbolically, and much less literally than they have been in the earlier parts of the ring. How, how do we hear this right away? What is, how does the Norn scene begin? So the first, this, that's Brunhilde's awakening. We've only heard it once, but it's so dramatic, and we hear it lots of times in that one time. We completely associate that with Brunhilde's awakening. And this, of course, that's this, the Rhine. So what does this have to do with either Brunhilde's awakening or the Rhine? Well, it does. In, in both cases, it does, but in a very unliteral way. Now, this I could go right through the scene. And sh I mean, there's lots of things coming up later that are that are also. But I think right the very the way the scene begins, just opening up with with Brunhilde's awakening, is already a very metaphoric use of that awakening. There there are I think undercurrent reasons why he uses that besides just the parallel. I mean, I think the number one reason is it makes a wonderful dark parallel to Brunhilde's awakening. Um, and it reinforces the fact that the, 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 the Norns are sort of a voice of nature. Um, um, and it, it creates also this sort of cosmic sense, having that. Anytime we hear that kind of thing, it has sort of a great cosmic sense in the, in the, in the context of, of the whole ring cycle. But um, um, I think the use of Brunhilde's awakening is already highly metaphoric. I don't think it's something he would have done in the earlier part of the ring, as it happens. Okay, let's go on to number six. Number seven, sorry. Brunhilde's famous new motive. We talked about this, but not this aspect of it. One of the really
really beautiful motives in the ring, one of the famous motives in the ring, and one that's very, very much associated with, with Brunhilde, all through Gunnar Demmering. We have not heard it before. Um, so why does Wagner introduce a new motive for Brunhilde? So does this motive remind us of anything else in the ring? Anything, any, anybody come up with something that this reminds you of? Uh, you said the other day that it reminds you of the... the what about just the main part? What if, what if I play instead of playing? What if I took away that turn and played? Or what if I just played? Do we associate that with Siegfried, really? We do associate it with Siegfried, but that's, is that its primary association? Where do we first hear that? First hear that all over Act One of Valkyra, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's associated with the Velzigs. It's associated entirely with the Velzigs. And we hear it, of course, in, 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 in uh, Siegfried's funeral march, also at the beginning, when he started telling the story of the Velzings as a whole. Um, yeah, it's a motive very, very much associated with the Velzings. And it's, it's practically the same if you just take, if you just take away the, uh, if I play. And even has the, the, it has the same sort of similar little turn, except that it's at the end. And here he puts it at the beginning. It's remarkably similar. I mean, very similar. Um, um, it seems to me that Wagner's telling us that um, Brunhilde now is, is the carrier of this motive. <laughs> and this motive has to do with the the fate of, this, of Wotan's idea. The Velsings are the, 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 not the first manifestation of Wotan's idea, but the, the, the most fruitful one. And, and so it sort of puts her in the line of Siegmund and Sieglinde. That motive was just as much attached to Sieglinde as Siegmund, maybe almost a little more. Siegfried, certainly all through Act One and Act Two of, of, of Siegfried, we hear that motive, and Act Three, too, we hear it associated very much with Siegfried. And now, we hear it um, associated with Brunhilde. And an interesting f factor is, is this motive disappears until Siegfried's uh, narration, where it becomes very important again. I, the, the passage I just played, this is a... We really haven't heard it until then. So it kind of comes back, and then, of course, in Siegfried's funeral march. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's sort of, she's become the, the exponent of whatever the idea that motive is in the first place, which I think has to do with the, 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 the fate, the role, the function, the, the, the story of, of the Velsungs, of Wotan's idea. Number eight, the light motifs associated with Gutrun and the Gibichungs in general, and also their wedding day, has a significant history in the ring. What is it and what interpretation does it suggest? Um, Now, I talked about it as a parallel to the, the love motive in, 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 uh, in, in, in Valkyrie. I'm not talking about that, that, that now. That this was a parallel to when, when, when Gutrun comes and offers a, a, a Siegfried the, the, the potion. It's a kind of an awful parallel to when Sieglinde offers the, 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 the mead to Siegmund when they begin to fall in love in Act 1 of, of, of Die Valkyra. Um, this also... The same item. Same music. That's... They're, they're practically the same. Uh, uh, the one is a horn call and the other is melodic. But they both have a, um, a history in the ring long before the Gibichungs have come on the scene. Anybody tell me what it is and what it might mean? What, when do we hear this? Of course, that's the beginning of Act Two of, of Tristan, too. But that's, <laughs> that's another one. And this is, by the way, one of these things that um, Derek Cook loves to talk about. Um, this, is a, this is a musical idea which occurs throughout Wagner. Uh, and, and he says, stands for something basic to Wagner. I'm not particularly interested in that subject because I think it's one of these things that you really can't ever quantify. I mean, you could just, um, you know, I'd like to look at what we have and sort of deal with that rather than sort of try to imagine meaning over a lot. But it, he has a very good point. Anyway, um, we hear that, for instance, in this form, in... in in its original form, only once, actually, clearly, in um, Gutter Demmerung. It's at the very end of the scene with Brunhilde and, and Valtrauta, when Brunhilde is telling Valtrauta to go away. 
I don't ever want to see you again. And we hear this. exact same notes, right? And we've heard this prominently. Where have we heard this before? This is a quotation. The end of the, the, the uh, Brunhilde um, Waltraut scene, this, this little passage I just played you, is an exact quotation, modulated, of a very important passage we've heard earlier in the ring. Not just the motif, the whole passage. Anybody tell me where that is? Where are we hearing? Mm -hmm. O Schande, O Schmach, O Heiligste Dot. What is with? Who sang that? And where? Wotan, where? It's the beginning of his monologue. It's the big, this is the big outbreak that starts Wotan's monologue. And. Yes, second act of Die Valkyrie, the beginning of Wotan's monologue. It's a very important passage. So, why would she quote? By the way, we've heard it one other time, too, but I, I, let's just deal with this. this is, so this is a direct quotation, a direct quotation. I mean, it's not just a, 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 I often talk about this harkens to things. This is a quotation, verbatim, one half step higher, of about 32 measures of music from the beginning of Wotan's monologue. What is Wotan upset about? Yeah, at this point, the, his, his initial upset, uh, upset is that Fricka has, has stymied his plans. In other words, that the music here it does not really represent Brunhilde, but rather represents Wotan, and that, um, or represents uh, Valtraut, in, in this case, as a, as a mouthpiece for Wotan, that Wotan's plans have once, have been, once again been stymied. They certainly have. Um, I think, though, that there's a little bit more to it than that. Um, and and, and my, I think my next question is about the, yes. My, number, number nine is about it, so I want to talk about that in the case, case of number nine. But um, um, right now I'm just dealing with that as, or, so what is, what is so, but uh, this, this motive is the, is the main motive associated with Fricka in, 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 in Valkyra. That's, that's, I'll just leave it at that. It's, we hear it hundreds of times, always associated with Fricka in Valkyra. And always associated with Fricka specifically as her function in Valkyra. Not as her function as, as, as Wotan's wife or uh, uh, Wotan's uh, mate and, and, and fellow goddess that we hear a lot in Rheingold, but specifically as, as the Fricka who is putting the, 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 the stick between the spokes of his bicycle, who is, who is upsetting his plans. So this, I think that if uh, you could almost call this the motive of upsetting plans. Whether Frick is right or wrong is not the point. The, this, what the symbolism of the motive is. So I think we hear that as sort of Fricka as the, uh, uh, um, uh, the person who is getting in Wotan's way. And here, okay, this beautiful, sweet motive, or even sounds so noble and strong. Yeah, the Gibbetschung, in other words, it's making a parallel between the Gibbetschungs and Fricka, but between the Gibbetschungs and forces in the way of, maybe not Wotan's plan, this thing, but in the way of, of um, um, it's kind of sending us a message about the, the, the Gibbetschungs. Brunhilde has very much stymied Wotan's plan. And, and you could say that the Gibbetschungs, both in their sort of, sort of festive uh, uh, manifestation and in their Beautiful, plangent, um, it's one of my favorite motives, um, um, manifestation. Nevertheless, the source of that music is something that we very strongly associate with, uh, with, with um, negative forces, with forces in the way. By the way, according to Derek Cook, this idea is in all of Wagner's works, from Liebes for Boat to Parsifal, um, um, stands for uh, negative forces, forces in conflict with the, 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 the main trend. He has a very good, he goes right through it. In Tristan, it's associated with day, for instance. You know, the beginning of act. Same, same, same notes. Uh, um, and that's 
associated with day, day versus night idea. So there's perhaps something to it. I, as I say, that's not my field, but that, that there is perhaps something to it. It's not that Fricka is bad. It's not that Fricka is evil, but, it's, but she is conventional and her conventionality or, or whatever, you know, she's, she's in the way of Wotan's plans. The Gibichungs are in the way of, in a way, Wotan's plans, you could say. Um, um, if Wotan's plans are the triumph of, 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 Zig, of what he tells of, uh, Erda in, in his big scene with her in Act Three of, Sieg, of Siegfried, his plans is that their love embodied by this theme. Oh. will transform the world. This will be the great tr world transforming thing. And if that's true, the Gibbetsons are certainly in the way, especially uh, Guterina. Since he's gonna fall in love with Guterina, it's gonna mess the whole thing up. Number nine, the ball trout scene has perhaps the most advanced in association of drenched music in the entire ring. Well, the reason, I'll answer that right away. I guess the reason is the, the ball trout scene is, first thing, as being in the heart of act one, has the most metaphoric music in the ring. More motives used for reasons that are not straightforward. Um, than any other part of the ring. But also, since it deals with um, Votan, who's, of all the characters in the ring, the one who has the most complex uh, set of music attached to him, in this post-God state, in the state of his decline, uh, uh, it kind of makes sense that there would be this extremely drenched atmosphere with lots and lots of associations. The, the Voltrout uh, scene is very, very complex. Um, I just want to throw out one thing about the Voltrout scene, which has to do with this moment um, that we just talked about, the one I just played where Brunhilde rejects um, um, Valtraut. There's one other place where we hear this music. I told you there were three times we hear a verbatim quotation of the beginning of, Vot of Wotan's um, uh, monologue. This is the third one. Anybody can remember, this would be hard. Even though it's a verbatim, it's 32 bars long, verbatim quotation of the same, you know. A whole sequence of motives. There's that rising thing, and then there's the curse motive, and there's... That, that opposition motive and other and then always at the end and usually since it ends with this you know with something having to do with the rejection of love um, just before we hear this part when 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 it, uh, Brunhilde tries a different tactic to, to get Siegfried off her back uh, um, when she first when Siegfried first really goes after her and she pushes him away and says no God ever touched me like that it's that we hear it when she's rejecting Siegfried when she pushes him away, we hear this exact, exact verbatim quote of the beginning of Wotan's monologue and, and then the quote of what we'll hear at the end of the Valtrout narrative. Anybody have an explanation? I, for me, it's clear, but uh, she's getting in the way. <laughs> she's, she, and if you want to say the conventionality thing, that's too, too. But conventionality in the sense of who she was. Who she was is getting in the way of who she will be. It doesn't, doesn't for very long, but it does then, for sure. It's also highly ironic that she, both times, would quote her father. And look at the two places where she quotes her father. She quotes her father when she rejects Siegfried. And then, of course, later on, she does reject Siegfried. And she quotes her father in his despair when she refuses to give up the ring. And I, I feel that um, we make a mistake when we look at this as, as necessarily a noble, wonderful action on her part. Um, I think that there's a much more double-bladed action, at least in terms of Wagner's view of the ring. It's the way it has to be. The ring has to become... In a way, though, isn't that the way the ring works? Haven't we seen in Rheingold that the, 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 what, what, what the ring does is, is, is the image of what the, the deepest need, the deepest dream, the, the deepest good of each person is. So um, Donner sees it as, as the ultimate weapon, and Wotan sees it as the ultimate source of control, and, and Albrecht sees it as the ultimate source of wealth. And Fricka sees it as the ultimate source of attraction, physical, they'll keep Wotan at home and have a happy home life. And Brunhilde sees it as love, as the embodiment of her love, the deepest need of her love. And it's just a piece of gold. Why the hell can't she throw it out? What does, what, what does it, for her, what, what the, but she can't. That she certainly can't. We, we thrill with her, we love her for it. We think this is great, but in a way, she, she herself is the one who's in the way. I mean, it's not, it's not uh, Valtraut who's in the way. I don't think that, I, I, I disagree with Simon on this. I don't think that we're expected to, to think that Brunhilde is, we see it as a very ambivalent action. She can do nothing else. She is someone who is, at this point, love is clearly her highest good. But why does she need the ring for the love to be her highest good? What, what, why does she need to have the ring on her finger for love to be her highest good? 
She knows the whole story. She knows what the ring means. She knows about all this. And yet she says, forget it. I'm not going to give it away. Couldn't that mean that she's as much under the spell of the ring as, as Fafner was? Yeah. Except that it certainly makes a contrast between Fafner, who all he cares about is security, you know, nothing else, and that's what the ring does for him. Uh, um, for her, the ring seems to mean love. I, I, number, t number 10, I've already done this. That it's related to Loga. So it's, it's, it's a vicious and terrible form of the same plotting that Loga did. It's a parallel between Loga's plotting and Rheingold and, and, and uh, um, Hunding and then Brunhilde and, and um, Gunther's plotting against Siegfried in, in Act 2 and 3 of, of uh, Gunther Demmerer. And, and my extra credit question we've already, we've already done. That we, we know we hear the spear motive prominently in First Act of Gunther Demmerung as an ironic memory that Siegfried is, is becoming caught up in his, his kind of silly bargain, his silly pact with, with, with Gunther, orchestrated, of course, by Hagen, just as Wotan was with his less silly pacts to, to, to get the uh, giants to build Valhalla. If Brunhilde uh, loves the ring so much, how did it happen to be on Siegfried's finger in Act 2? And why, when Siegfried's asked about it, does he say, oh, I got it from a, uh, a dragon? And, and uh, um, okay, so that's a, that's a good question and one that has given a lot of people a lot of trouble. Um, because they feel like that it, it, if, if taken at face value, it could certainly make Siegfried seem very duplicitous. And, and very, as a matter of fact, just, just, just a, a robber, just a flat robber, he just steals a ring. First thing, as far as his taking the ring off her finger, that I think is easily explained. He comes there, he's got a job for his friend um, 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 Gunter. He's got to subdue this woman so he can take her down the mountain and, and, and perform the, the, the switch. So this woman at first looks stunned and then says, stand back, this ring makes me strong as steel. You can't touch me as long as I've got this ring on my finger. So what does he do? He takes it away from her. Turns out she's wrong, but she thinks it is. Brunhilde's convinced that by holding up her hand with that ring that she's strong as steel. What, what, what the power of the ring actually is, is open to interpretation. My feeling is it never does anybody any good, except for, for Alberich. But maybe, maybe Brunhilde doesn't kiss it. She forgets to do the important thing. But whatever it is, it doesn't work. But Siegfried takes it away from her because she forces him to. Now, why doesn't he say that? He can't say it. For, first thing, he may bona fidely be confused. This is a pretty tricky business. It's one thing when you have complete amnesia. He doesn't have complete amnesia. He's only forgotten Brunhilde. So, you know, it is kind of confusing. He, he, he knows he got the ring from the dragon. He, I mean, he probably says, yeah, whatever, what is that ring? You know, it's kind of be confusing. But in any event, he can't say anything about it in front of the vassals because he's protecting uh, Gunther. Yeah, so, but it's, it's, uh, it's, that's a moment that's bothered a lot of people. Um, um, I, do you think that their marriage is ever consummated? I sure don't. No. I, I don't think she's, I, I don't think Gunther gets very close to her. I think Gunther is scared stiff of Brunhilde.